Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Minwi Metri. The opening stanza of my discussion tonight is a stanza we chant every week. Gatte gatte, paragatte, parasamgatte, bodhiswaha. Every week when we chant the Heart Sutra, uh, and the Heart Sutra is chanted around the world, wow, thousands of times a day, uh, basically at every uh, Mahayana, certainly at every Zen temple or Zen affiliated temple around the world, they chant that. And uh, it has great meaning. And we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. This as I mentioned, it was uh, Master Unsan that got me thinking about this. A couple of weeks ago, uh, he started asking us some questions, not really expecting answers from us, but to get us thinking. And thinking he did, thinking he got me, I mean. Um, he would ask you questions, he would ask us questions like, what does it mean to be enlightened? Who's enlightened and how do you know? Um, and these were all questions that I think come up in Dharma circles a lot. And people ask, well, is that teacher enlightened? Is that student enlightened? What do we mean by enlightened, right? Um, and so as I got to thinking about his message that he was giving us and kind of a challenging questions and we all sat quiet for a while, some of us chimed in every now and then, but mostly it was a, a question without answer service, right? Um, and I got to thinking to myself, well, what did the Buddha, and by the Buddha, I mean the Sakyamuni Buddha, what did Sakyamuni Buddha tell us about enlightenment? And what did he define it as? Um, and then how in the years and generations after the great sage of the Sakyans, how did we change this definition of enlightenment? And did we, in fact, change the definition of enlightenment? Um, so again, I go back to the Heart Sutra, because as most of you know, that postdates Sakyamuni Buddha by several hundred years. Um, and the, the gata at the end that we have turned into a mantra um, was probably even much later than the original um, writing of these Prajnaparamita Sutras. But it answers the same question. Gate, gate, paragate, parasamgate, bodhiswaha. Uh, without playing stump the chump or uh, putting anybody on the spot, does anybody have a good translation into English for that, that stanza, that gate, gate, paragate, parasamgate, bodhiswaha? Yeah, Gone beyond. Okay, good. Sorry. Going, going, going beyond. Robert, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, same thing. Uh, beyond, beyond, beyond the beyond. Um, all hail the enlightened mind, or something to that effect. Okay. Yeah. So the the bodhiswaha at the end definitely is kind of all hail the enlightened mind. It's kind of uh, to to use kind of a Judeo Christian terminology. It's kind of like hallelujah enlightenment, right? I mean, that's more or less what it means. Um, but what are they going beyond? Going beyond what? You've heard the story before about the Buddha and he's telling his, he's telling his, for lack of a better word, his followers, the, uh, his disciples, those who, who, the, those who, who took on the robe and followed him around. He told them before, he says, you know, when you're on one side of the shore, you needed this raft and you need this raft, which he called the Dharma, to get to the other side. But when you get to the other side, you don't need it anymore. Again, we have that question, the other side of what? And that's what we're going to talk about just a little bit tonight. So, a couple of weeks ago, like I said, when Master Unsan was asking us these questions, you know, kind of what's enlightenment and what are we talking about? Um, 
the, the one person that's easy for us to pick out historically uh, that was truly enlightened, of course, is the Sakyamuni Buddha uh, or Buddha Gautama. And uh, there is a poem in the Samyutta Nikaya uh, that Mahamogalana, uh, well, Mahamogalana had been given a sermon in front of the Buddha. The Buddha was on a, sitting on a mountain and Mahamogalana uh, had been basically kind of given a sermon to some of the other monks. And one of the other monks in, in praise of Mogalana uh, had kind of recited a, a poem. And uh, I know in the past we've had some good poems uh, read and written uh, among our Sangha. So uh, I, I know some of you really appreciate a good poem. And uh, here's one that uh, the venerable, the venerable Vangisa had said about Mahamogalana. He says, while the sage is seated on the mountain slope, gone far, gone to the far shore of suffering, his disciples sit in attendance on him. Triple knowledge men who have left death behind. Mogalana, great in spiritual power, encompassed their minds with his own, and searching, he came to see their minds fully realized without acquisitions. Thus, those perfect in many qualities attend upon Gotama, the sage, perfect in all respects, gone to the far shore of suffering. So that shore that we're going or aiming to get to the other side of is the shore of that vastness, that vast body of water that the Buddha called suffering. Thus, his Four Noble Truths right? It all comes down to this simple lesson of the Buddha and his four, four noble truths. There is suffering. There's a cause of suffering, which we know to be greed, hate, and delusion. Uh, there's a way to end suffering, and the end of suffering is, the, is following the Noble Eightfold Path. A really simple four, four stanza rules that we call the Four Noble Truths. But that epitome, the, what the Buddha later called as reaching nirvana, or nirvana as it was translated into Sanskrit, reaching nirvana was the cessation of suffering. And so when a person, when we say in the Mahayana tradition that there is a Buddha in all of us, A, we're saying, all of us have the capability to overcome suffering. We can do that. Inherent in each one of us, we can overcome suffering. And that's the true Buddha inside of us. Even as we look at the writings of, of um, Bodhidharma, for example, if I can get my phone to turn to that next page. So we look at the writings of Bodhidharma and uh, Bodhidharma talks about the same exact thing. So in the writings of, the, of, of Bodhidharma, uh, uh, and I'm sure some of you took, took, probably took that course, uh, or at least have read the book, took the course through Bodhidharma University or, or another school of thought, uh, or you've read his writings anyway. Bodhidharma said, the Buddha in the mind is like, is like a fragrance in a tree. The Buddha comes from a mind free of suffering, just as a fragrance comes from a tree free of decay. And then he goes on a little bit further and he says, a Buddha refers to a pure and awakened mind. Awakened to what? Awakened to that cessation that a person can exist and not suffer and understanding how not to suffer. Now, the interesting part of this, of this um, mantra that we chant when we say gate gate para gate para samgate bodhiswaha is that it's proof to us when we chant it, there can be this progress towards full enlightenment. And there can be some enlightenment along the way. And how do we get there? Going going further, going all the way to the other shore, right? So we can go past part of that suffering. And we learn that through meditation. And through meditation, 
we can learn to control our minds so that we suffer even less as time goes on. And when we have fully learned to abandon all suffering, we've learned what the Buddha learned under the Bodhi tree. And that was his great awakening. His great awakening was when he realized he no longer had to suffer. And he knew how to control his mind in a way that he never suffered again. That was his awakening. Did that mean that the Buddha never got sick? No, of course not. We know there are lots of stories where Buddha Sakyamuni, where Sakyamuni Buddha uh, either got injured or got sick and his monks had to attend to him. And most of the stories we know, it was Ananda that was attending to him. But it doesn't mean he suffered. It meant he was still human. There's one that reminds me, uh, the one that I'm reminded of is in the Samyutta Nikaya, where uh, it, it's called the splinter translated into English, but it's talking about a, a piece of stone had somehow or another injured the Buddha's foot, and they called it a splinter. But I don't think it's a little splinter of a rock as you and I might think, but his foot was pretty badly injured, probably got infected, I don't know, but he was laid up on the ground for quite some time. And yet he handled it all very stoically and never complained. Um, and he meditated and passed the time um, such that he did not let this pain that he experienced turn into suffering. And so this part of the Samyutta Nikaya is about um, Devas coming out of the heavens and praising the Buddha that here's this man who's in excruciating pain and yet he handles it like a lion lying at rest. Um, and, and so they, they give great praise to him. Later we read, even in the, the Parinibbana Sutta of the, of the Buddha, we learn about how the Buddha got sick from eating uh, at a certain follower's house. Um, and the Buddha knew it was going to be his turn to die. And he was really sick along the way. And there were times when it was so bad that he told Ananda, Ananda, make me a pallet so I can lay down because I'm just, I can't go any further. And yet he didn't suffer. So clearly he got sick. Clearly he got injured, but he didn't suffer. So I think of these things and I think to myself, the answer to most Dharma questions can usually be tied right back to the Four Noble Truths. You want to know what enlightenment is? Go back to the Four Noble Truths. You want to know about greed, hatred, and delusion and how they are the poisons of the mind? It's all in the Four Noble Truths. You want to know, you know, how do we concentrate our minds and learn to meditate and all those things? It's in the Noble Eightfold Path, which is just a part of the Four Noble Truths. It's all right there. And again, I, I'm going to turn back because to turn this a little bit away from the Theravada and back more towards the Zen and the uh, that Bodhidharma left to us. Uh, Bodhidharma in the same chapter went on a little bit more. And, uh, and I want to read to you this last paragraph kind of in closing as we talk about, because if you think about it and you listen to this, you'll see there's some common topics of today. And this was, you know, uh, when was Bodhidharma? 500, 500 of the common era, something like that. Uh, at least a thousand years after the Buddha. So anyway, so here's what Bodhidharma wrote. Reality has no high or low. If you see high or low, it isn't real. A raft isn't real, but a passenger raft is. A person who rides such a raft can cross that which isn't real. That's why it's real. According to the world, there's male and female, rich and poor. According to the way, there's no male or female, no rich or poor. When the goddess, and here the goddess they're talking about, Guan Yin, when the goddess realized the way, she didn't change her sex. When the stable boy awakened to the truth, he didn't change his status. Free of sex and status, they shared the same basic appearance. The goddess searched 12 years for her womanhood without success. To search 12 years for one's manhood would likewise be fruitless. The 12 years refer to the 12 entrances. So the 12 entrances that they're talking about here is uh, basically uh, the 12 bodily senses, the 12 bodily um, 
functions. I mean, the the six senses, the the six functions in the uh, in the mind and thinking. So, um, you know, like we have five senses we know of, and we have a mind, and so total all those things together, and you get twelve. So, what the Buddha is saying there, and I I relate this to something in my own personal life. What the Buddha is saying there is that the Dharma is universal. And it doesn't matter if you're man, woman, doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, it doesn't matter any of those things. What matters is, can you take the effort to cease the suffering? And when you do, you've reached your nirvana. And so as we, I know I used to suffer a lot more than I do now. Why? I, I used to have PTSD from some bad experiences uh, and terrorist bombings and such. And I suffered from it greatly. Mental PTSD out the ass, so to speak. It was, it beat me down. Um, ruined my life in a lot of ways. But I started meditating and I learned to go past that. And am I on the other shore? No, I am not on the other shore. But you know what? I'm halfway through that river and there's a lot of shit behind me that doesn't bother me anymore. And I don't suffer from it. So... I've reached a degree of enlightenment because I've learned how not to suffer from things, I, especially things that were very suffering to me in the past. So there's that way. And there's this gradual enlightenment. I hope eventually I get to the point where I don't suffer about any of it anymore, about any part of life. Um, but I see why it was so glorious and beautiful to the Buddha when he finally realized he never had to suffer again. Because I know what a relief it was to me when I realized I didn't have to suffer from my PTSD anymore. So I, I leave that with you guys as you think about, sometimes we get these questions, we get them from our Zen master, or we get them from each other, and it seems like a hard question. But maybe it's just the question that we're stirring around in our mind that's hard. The answers are usually pretty simple. And the answers usually go back to those four noble truths. Thank you, guys.